This is Jack Bonney, Program Director for WSNC 90.5 FM. I am joined today by documentary film producer Jason DeBose, who is involved in a documentary film entitled The Music Never Dies. Today we are going to discuss that film, what it is about, and how you can find more information concerning its production. Jason, how are you doing today? Rather nice. I was actually expecting it to be quite a bit hotter. Every memory I have of visiting the South as a child was sweltering. It was 90 plus, and I feel like we're in the low to mid 80s here, and that suited me pretty okay. Yeah, and we've no complaints here as well. We've had a relatively mild summer for sure. Before we get into the details of the film, what is your background? Have you been involved with documentary films like this in the past? Well, as a student of film at uh, Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, I did study for some years uh, bits and pieces, documentary film here and there. My first actual professional work in documentary film would have been with a company in California that I worked with called Morning Star Entertainment. They did a lot. They were in Burbank, California, a couple of towns over from where I grew up, and they did a lot of television series that you might have seen on Discovery here or there. They did a handful of A&E biography and things in that vein. And, yeah, everything I did between Morning Star Entertainment and this project were much more commercial studio comedy and studio action all right well getting into the details of this film uh, can you tell the audience the background of where the idea of this film came from sure i uh, started out with our director his name's edward hillel he was newly moved into his studio in harlem new york he's an artist and he has worked uh, worked quite a lot of places but his art is now based in Harlem, New York, and he came from a background of both filmmaking and music journalism. And as just an artist who has any kind of artist habit of networking with the people in the creative industries around him, Edward eventually found his way into the company of jazz musicians in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s who were based in and around Harlem, New York. And he came upon the story of one in particular by the name of Jimmy Norman. Jimmy Norman is the figure we've shot the most so far. Uh, he's known to some as the baritone singer of the Coasters for a part of the 60s and to others as a producer for Bob Marley, but to Edward initially as the original writer of the lion's share of the lyrics, I should say, not all of the lyrics, but the lion's share of the lyrics of the Rolling Stones hit Time Is On My Side, which is known to Rolling Stones fans as the first Rolling Stones song to crack the U.S. Top Ten. And what got on Edward's radar is the fact that the Stones songwriter-producer, Jerry Rackavoy, that was working with the Stones at the time, hired Jimmy Norman for approximately... $125 to write the lyrics that we know today and subsequently carved him out of the distribution of the royalties and the result is Stones have managed to make I can't I can't quote it yet we're researching it but tens of millions potentially off of this song and Jimmy Norman saw not a dime beyond this initial cash outlay of approximately 125 bucks and Edward got wind of that, and he said in his exact words, well, I won't use his exact words, but <laughs> he did not find it remotely fair and said "This is there's a story here, and whether or not there's anything to be reaped from a legal standpoint, the world should know that this song is his. And it was uh, at that point, his, you know, he had a filmmaking background to begin with, and as an artist looking to be inspired, he found this story very magnetic given his music background and given the fact that a lot of the musicians uh, that have come to be associated with the film are quite local to where he already produces his artwork in his studio in Harlem. So he began to follow Jimmy Norman through average days in his life, ask him questions about the background of his musical career, which is long and storied. If you go through all the jazz and all the popular music, he's he really... At both in front of the glass and behind the glass. He played with qu 
quite a many of the greats and produced for quite a many of them. And this story was the one that really, really grabbed him. And he attempted to see <clears throat> just how much he could learn about what was lost, what's still disputed today, and how many people could verify uh, Jimmy Norman's claims. And the more research he did, the more he found the story is legitimate. I myself have had a chance to catch up with uh, Jimmy Norman's PR director at the time, and he's confirmed his own details, including that the fact that uh, this Jerry Rackavoy, the songwriter producer, denied and denied and denied every connection of Jimmy Norman to this time was on my side until his death. And further to that, that um, the Stones lawyers will no longer deny it. They've seen a preponderance of the evidence and they're not planning on fighting over it any further and also are apparently not planning on arranging any kind of um, recompense for what would now be the estate of Jimmy Norman. Interestingly enough, both uh, Jerry Rackavoy and Jimmy Norman passed away in 2011 within five months of each other. Hmm. And ha that's, by that time, it was nearly 50 years that the song had been in this dispute. Released in 64, 2014 marks 50 years. 2011, they were getting toward 47 years under this controversy. Wow. And <clears throat> beyond Jimmy Norman, uh, there's some other jazz musicians in particular that are focused in this film, or sure, we have shot quite a we shot quite a handful of footage of Art Blakey's oldest daughter. Her name's Evelyn, and she toured with and without Art for the lion's share of her life. And we got to follow her through some of the performances that she gave near the end. Um, that were arranged via the Jazz Foundation of America. You may or may not be familiar with this organization, headed by a number of show business luminaries, including uh, Danny Glover and you know advisory board member Winton Marcellus, and he was able to get a this advisory board and the board of the organization. Among other things, they provide. The, for the subsistence of these musicians over a certain age and who've gone through an application process proving they've given a certain amount of contribution to the jazz industry. It's not just by virtue of being over, you know, over a cutoff age and playing jazz. They really need to have given their lives to the music and to live performance. And in the case of uh, this Evelyn Blakey, she was on this this list and this landed her in a position as well to have the Jazz Foundation of America arrange gigs for her in the forums that, you know, they knew would have a taste for it. In the case of what Edward shot, we caught up with her at a an elementary school. By the time she was in her 70s, there wasn't a lot of giant gigs um, ar around every corner, but she still had she still had a name and she still had a voice and she still had a drive to share everything she can could about her father as well as about the song she was singing and she's one of these performers almost Bruce Springsteen like where she likes to tell a lot of stories about her life to between songs to bring people into the music and she shares a lot about her travels in Japan and Russia uh, all over Europe all over the United States, a really, really long and storied career. With the two of them and, and some of the other musicians that, that featured in the film, uh, why, why do you think it is important that their story be told? Well, there's a lot for jazz aficionados simply to know that these musicians that they may have been quite familiar with when the musicians were in their let's say, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. That's the part of their career that's pretty much logged on vinyl. It might, it will serve their curiosity to know what came after this. Is you know, it, There's plenty of just early death in the 30s and 40s, but that's not the lion's share of them. They end up continuing to perform in most cases, and those who were fans of them as jazz musicians 
would be fascinated to learn just what happened after. Not terribly well documented. If you're talking about their popular music careers and the people that they toured with, it's kind of a 20 feet from stardom effect of you get this original, you already, you come to any given mm, discussion of a musician or an album or a lyric and you have this story that's the one on record. It's the story that is told in the video. It's the story that was shared on all of the, let's say, late night shows when Tour X kicked off. But you get it from that maybe singer-songwriter, maybe just singer's perspective, and you don't hear it from the perspective of those who were close by, who saw it from a different angle, who saw a little something that they may never have shared and something that they may not have felt was relevant until finally someone puts a camera and a microphone in front of them and we get to be brought into their world and get to see this just, it's almost like getting one of those DVDs that lets you see a movie you already know from another angle. You just get to experience a new perspective and we want to be able to bring that for the popular music that these musicians participated in over the course of their the prime of their careers. And these these fascinating stories that go along with these careers, I know you have a plan to expose sort of this story to an international audience. Can you tell our audience more about that? Absolutely. We're set to do some further interviews in New York City of experts like Frank Beecham and uh, Frank Beecham being the PR rep of Jimmy Norman and others that we've been able to deduce, have information relevant to these musicians' careers. A lot of them are based in New York just because it's such a massive jazz city. And then further, we're going to uh, take a group of them, uh, likely a quartet, overseas to give them a chance to tour in areas where their music would be known by virtue of it having been sold internationally and by virtue in some cases of others having performed it, but in places where they've never performed themselves. And if we're talking about musicians still living on live gigs in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s, we're in a position of being able to give them a brand new audience that they can then tour well after this movie has come and gone. And the fact that it will be a documentary and the fact that it will be seen uh, quite widely, will expand their own names and expand their ability to be booked both abroad and in America. And it's kind of a gift to be to give to them, as well as a great excuse to tell a lot of great stories that will flash into their minds as they're back on tour, living the life that they've lived for so many decades. Sounds, sounds great, and I've seen the trailer, and, and, and I'm very interested in it. The film entitled, again, The Music Never Dies. Where can our listeners go to find out more information about the film? Well, there's certainly plenty to read on our homepage, which is musicneverdiesmovie.com, musicneverdiesmovie.com. And additionally, we have a Twitter feed on the at handle Never Dies Movie. And further to that, we're raising funds on Indiegogo, the crowdfunding platform, I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O that one can punch in the music never dies into and see the video that um, I shot with a filmmaker from Spain that I'm quite pleased to be working with that was able to capture in just three minutes essentially what it is we plan to do and tells a little bit more about the background of Jimmy Norman and of course tells how the audience can contribute to the production budget of the film and receive, among other things, an EP that we'll be producing, as well as a copy of the completed film. The EP will be recorded while we're touring, the best six to eight songs that we're able to reap from the tour dates, and then we'll have the film both available as a digital download and a DVD, and... For those who are quite wild about the topic, we're even offering a chance to tour with the band as they fly all over Europe, and that's set to take place in October. The funding is actually going to wrap up inside of the end of August, really inside of this week. We've got, at this point, three days left, 
And if they go to Indiegogo.com, they can see how far we've come and, of course, have a look at which perks of the film they may want to have a look at for themselves and contribute to getting this very, very cool, both New York, New Orleans, and overseas story told over the course of the coming months. Well, as you can hear, this is a very interesting project and film, and I definitely will be excited to see the final product. Final question is, would you say you got to know some of these musicians more through their musical lives or more through their personalities and personal lives? Well, the cool thing about it is, well, one, their musical lives are their personal lives in that they subsist on these gigs that they play in a way where you know watching the interview unfold that this is how much this person's about to earn playing this gig and this is how much they need to pay in rent and these are their medical bills that you know we've discussed in previous parts of the interview and you get into that in that sense a very personal one in another sense um you get to see what happens between the periods where they even know what their next gig is in the case of this jimmy norman there was a moment in his life where he was in a tough spot to find more gigs or I should say to find enough gigs and in that same moment just by chance I guess he had more time on his hands and he decided he would do some spring cleaning get rid of some of the junk in his apartment and at that point this uh, Frank Beecham happened to be over for a business meeting as he was about to take care of some of the latest of what he'd all, what he'd uh, gathered together to get rid of and among the things he was ready to toss in the trash was a giant sack like it basically I, I can, you can imagine a glad sack full of these little slips of paper and before jimmy norman was able to do that frank uh just out of curiosity inquired as to just what it is jimmy was up to and you know he said getting rid of some old stuff stuff i'm not going to be needing anymore and you know it's taking up space and then he said well, what's in what's in the bag he said oh just you know, some stuff I scrawled on, uh, some old papers. And sure enough, Frank gets him uh, to open the bag. And it's a bag full of handwritten lyrics of all these songs that Jimmy Norman has written, had written over the years. And, you know, Frank asks, you know, he's kind of in disbelief because he, he figures if it's this large a sack of paper, this is A, probably decades old in terms of, uh, to uh, overall volume and B is worth quite a bit especially to a musician well prepared to get rid of it all meaning it's not like he's a hoarder and he's going to hold on to it like grim death his thing was essentially I'm ready to part with these and Frank informed him there's a memorabilia market the likes of which you would never believe of you know Stones fans Bob Marley fans etc who would really mm, pay through the nose to have access to even a handful of these scrawled sheets of paper. And sure enough, uh, Frank got on the phone, made the proper calls, got his work into some of these, you know, memorabilia spots, um, auctions here and there. There might have even been some eBay at some point. And he was able to sell these, uh, <clears throat> sell off these pieces of his lyrical history, handwritten lyrical history, to a number of bidders to the tune of something like $25,000. It was upwards of $20,000. And, of course, for a musician who's gig to gig, that's the kind of surprise you don't yeah. run into every day. So Jimmy was, of course, beside himself. And you got to we get to pick up these little moments of, so that's the life they're living when they don't quite have, well, they, you know, no one's ever had a 401k plan in jazz. It just doesn't exist but these moments of wanting to know if they're going to get over that next hurdle, moments like that we're able to share, if not via uh, the interviews themselves with uh, Jimmy who lived them, we have access to those who knew him and those who dealt with him on a business, from a business perspective and got to see all of these things unfold one step at a time. Wow. And the story is uh, one of the many stories you'll see in the film – Again, the film entitled The Music Never Dies. Uh, we'll give out those websites as we move along here during the next hour. And thank you for coming in, Jason. Awesome. Glad I could make it. Thank you, Jack. Back to some more jazz. <laughs> 